Return of the King. The burning roof collapsed. Looking out the window, Swedish King Charles XII, Karl den Tolfte, spotted thousands of Turks and Tartars waving their swords, taunting, Iron Head, come out and surrender. It was very much a case of, how did I get into this mess? Well, it began back on June 28, 1709. What was left of the finest army in Europe had quit the battlefield of Poltava. The defeat there, which we saw in the episode Poltava, had turned into a disaster. 5,000 Swedes had perished on the battlefield and the remaining army of 14,000 utterly exhausted and demoralized men had been cut off by their Russian enemy. Swedish King Karl had been lucky enough to not only survive, but also to escape capture. Many of his loyal officers had paid with their lives in the final melee with the Russian cavalry to save their wounded king. With just 1,500 men, Karl rode south, down the river Dnieper, looking for safety. Relentlessly pursued by his enemies and fatigued by the harsh summer sun, they crossed the steppes into Ottoman territory near the Black Sea. A delay at the fortress of Oshakau, where the local pasha haggled over the price of passage, cost Karl a further 800 men of his rearguard to his pursuers. It seemed that one thing ruled this land more than anything else, money. His band continued its journey until they reached the mighty Ottoman fortress of Bender on the Dniester, one of the most strategically important strong points in the whole region. Far, far away from Sweden, Karl tried to be an example to his men. Despite a major leg wound which caused him terrible agony, he exuded optimism, assuring his soldiers that the fortunes would soon reverse once more. Indeed, the Swedes suddenly enjoyed a level of comfort, safety, and luxury they hadn't experienced in the last couple of years. Karl was a personal guest and friend of Sultan Ahmed III, not just because of his royal status, but because Sweden was the enemy of the Ottomans' great enemy. Both the local Khans as well as the Ottoman Pashas hated the Russians, and their empires had crossed swords several times in the past. Karl would, in fact, spend years in a luxurious mansion protected by a Janissary honor guard. He kept his own court and kept himself informed about the situation in Europe through a number of exiled Swedish and Polish noblemen. Each morning, he held religious service and exercised his little army afterward. For his Turkish hosts, he was, he was quite the attraction. It is said that thousands traveled to Bender each day just to get a glimpse of the famous Northern Paladin. Many Muslims were impressed by his demeanor, many on the verge of idolatry, for Karl was a man who did not enjoy women or alcohol, who despised luxury and splendor, but was instead devoted to his religious beliefs. And it also helped that he still managed to be a big spender without any sense for money. This to the dismay of his officers who had protected the treasury at Poltava with their lives. Well, they didn't have unlimited funds anyhow and began racking up local debts as the treasury was depleted. But not just financially, as his stay grew ever longer, Karl became more and more of a burden to the Ottoman Empire in other ways, mainly because the Swedish king liked to involve himself in its politics. The outbreak of the Russo-Turkish War of 1710 was more or less started by Karl. Both the Ottomans and the Russians had been at each other's throats for decades, but during the Great Northern War, Karl had dismissed an actual Swedish-Turkish alliance against the Tsar. In late November 1710, Sultan Ahmed demanded on Karl's behalf that Tsar Peter not just give in to Ottoman demands, but also evacuate the territory he had conquered from the Swedes. Peter, of course, refused, so an army of 100,000 Ottomans and Tartars led by the Turkish Grand Vizier was set to march. The victory at Poltava had made Tsar Peter a bit overconfident, and he set out with a much smaller force to meet his local allies in Wallachia and Moldavia. But just as Karl had been fleeced for money, Tsar Peter would soon experience the self-serving interests and questionable loyalty of the local elite. By the time the armies met in 1711, the Ottoman force had doubled. At this site, the Wallachians 
promptly changed sides, and Tsar Peter found himself suddenly trapped in his own realm, encircled and cut off from retreat. It seemed like the Russians were doomed. All that was needed to change the course of history was the command for the Ottoman legions to attack, which never came. What came instead into the Turkish camp were wagons loaded with gold and a promise of a lasting peace between the two empires, an offer only a complete fool would accept. But the Grand Vizier must have been such a fellow that Peter was allowed to leave and fight another day. Tensions between Karl and the High Port, the Ottoman government, grew. By mid-1712, five Grand Viziers had been overthrown and the war against Russia restarted for the third time, in large part at Karl's urging. The Sultan wanted him to leave, offering to guard his journey back to Sweden, but Karl refused. A Swedish king would not be chased away like cattle, he said. He reminded the Sultan of his promise to recapture his territory but also feared that the Ottomans would betray him on the way home. Karl became known as Ironhead as much for his martial cunning as for his stubbornness. On February 1st, 1713, his daily divine service was suddenly interrupted by the noise of cannon fire and cries of Allah, Allah. When the Swedes rushed to the windows, they saw hordes of Turkish and Tartar soldiers storming their camp. Karl ran out of the house and jumped onto his horse, Full of rage, he saw that many of his soldiers had already laid down their arms in fear of the mob. Karl drew his sword and declared, All who have still a spark of loyalty in their breasts, follow me. With a group of his most loyal men, he charged headfirst into the crowd. Hacking with his sword, the king was soon thrown from his horse and grabbed by a huge janissary. Kicking him away, he was nearly killed by a pistol shot that grazed his head. Now missing an eyebrow and part of his left ear, he rushed back into his house. But the Janissaries were already inside, eagerly looting the place. A deadly brawl ensued in the salon. Carl and his men cut their way through the house, throwing the attackers back out of the windows. In a few moments, the rooms were full of smoke and fire. Three muscular Janissaries suddenly surrounded the king, trying to take him alive. Two of them Carl ran through with his sword, then parried the scimitar of the third at the last moment. Losing part of his thumb and forefinger, Carl swung, cut his enemy down. Just then, he was tackled by another assailant who pressed the monarch against the wall. Struggling for his life, it was the king's cook who jumped to the rescue, pistol in hand. Shouting a badass one-liner that is now lost to history, the cook shot the enemy dead and saved his king. After clearing the salon, the Swedes stormed Carl's bedroom. Furiously, Carl kicked down the door, stabbing the first two startled enemies before they could fire their guns and dragging a third one out from underneath his bed. By the afternoon, the house was finally empty of the enemy again. Well, except for all the enemy corpses. But now, the mob was throwing burning bundles of wood onto the roof, which soon began to burn. Outside, the crowd was yelling for Carl to come out and surrender. Proudly, the king declared that he would fight until he was either dead or captured. With a loud roar of approval, his men burst from the door. Sword in hand, the king led the charge and immediately stumbled over his own spurs. Falling to the ground, he was jumped by at least a dozen Janissaries. Seeing their king dragged away, the rest of the Swedes surrendered. This whole story, which was soon to be known as the Kalabalik of Bender, spread, of course, like wildfire through the European courts. The tale that the Swedish king had defended himself with only 40 men against a horde of 12,000 and 12 cannons for eight hours impressed friend and foe alike. But it also kind of meant that Karl's time in the Ottoman Empire was definitely up. Sweden's last ally in the fight against Russia was gone. Released from captivity, the king had no other option but to return home. In the years of his absence, though, the Swedish Empire had nearly ceased to exist. The other Swedish armies had been annihilated in their fights against the Danes and Russians trying to drive them from Swedish territory. In late November 1714, after 15 years away, 
King Carl once more stepped onto Swedish soil near Strålsund, on the north coast of what is now Germany. Overnight, the whole nation ran wild. Behold, thy king cometh, the people rejoiced. Like a champion returning to WrestleMania, Carl cut his promo, declaring that the most righteous and heroic of princes was back and here to utterly crush his enemies. He would take back what was rightfully his, and he would exact revenge on all those who had wronged Sweden in the past. Those Swedes who had sort of hoped that their king would return to Stockholm and make peace with his enemies were soon to be bitterly disappointed. Carl demanded that a new army be raised and prepared for war. Well, we saw in the Long Live the King episode how that turned out and how the century of Sweden as a great power came to its abrupt end with Carl's death. Perhaps the return of the king is not always as glorious as one imagines. Okay, I really liked the intro. I didn't know what it was going to be. Some of you may have noticed that uh, at the end of part two, it was a cliffhanger because we did part one was um, Phantom Menace. Part one, was, <laughs> <laughs> part one was A New Hope and part two was, uh, was The Empire Strikes Back. So, and we couldn't do Return of the Jedi. That was clever, mm -hmm. you know? And it's a third in the series as well. Yeah, I know. It's a, um, were, you, were you a big Tolkien fan? Very, very big. Uh, I, think, I think I read the books 10 times. When you were a teenager, 20s, or...? or... Well, most, first time I was a teenager. Yeah. Uh, I think I started it very young the first time. I had to give up after, yeah, 100 pages because it was too... It's too complicated. Yeah, yeah, when I was really young. But then I got back into it when I was a teenager. I love it. You know, there's a lot of flaws with different nations' educational system, and the American educational system is no different. Um, but one thing I really was thankful for later on in life was the, the books that we read, we had to read in school. I had to read The Hobbit in school. I was 12 years old, I had to read The Hobbit. Okay. And I loved The Hobbit. And from there, like you, I read The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Who knows how many times, every like seven or eight months, you just pick up one of the books again and start going. I mean, that, it's just, it's so good. Yes, it is. It's, I mean, and actually, to be fair, the Peter Jackson films are actually really well done. I like know, them as yeah. well, yeah, yeah. Even, I, I, even the very, Hated Hobbit trilogy, I like. Yeah, okay, okay, fair enough. But I, it's, it was weird, make, to me, the only thing that was weird about it was making it into a trilogy. Yeah, uh, it could, Hobbit, have you know? two, could have been two movies. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, in size, it's the size as, it's the size of around one or a bit less than one of the, of the Lord, Lord of the, the Rings, Rings trilogy. Yeah. So. What about the Silmarillion? Are they gonna do that as a movie? You know, or any of the oh, other. To be honest, I hope not. I think the book is boring as yeah. fuck. Well, you know, it's it. It doesn't have the one ring to rule them all. Well, it does, but it not <laughs> in, in its earlier form. So, but what is it? One ring to rule them all. One, one ring, ring to, to bind, bind them. them. One find them. To, find them. No, it's in the darkness. Bind, bind them. them. Yeah, yes. and in the darkness, find them. So, uh, hey, there's 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 some history. Yes. <laughs> Now you're not going to do a song about. Cut we, out actually, we actually we actually did a song about Lord of the Rings. You did, so called Shadows. Actually, the first song that was I ever wrote for Sabaton. We weren't even called Sabaton. It's on the Metalizer album on okay. the Fist for Fight demo. Yeah, the first song was about Lord of the Rings. Can we play a little bit of it? I certainly hope not. <laughs> Either right now when I'm looking like this, listening for the music. Either right now they've inherited, inserted the sound of crickets chirping. <laughs> and like a thing that says technical difficulties, technical difficulties, technical difficulties, or they're playing it. Um, but okay, well, that was um, you know Sauron's hopeful empire, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but he never really got to really expand beyond the, beyond the mountain beyond Mordor. No, nope. well, like Mordor. Mordor. They yes. have to say it like that. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Hey, you and Jose and Dave. You guys want to go to Mordor? 
with me. We're going this afternoon. You know, you have to say it like that. That's how it is. Okay, but anyway, um, anyhow, back to the actual Swedish Empire. Swedish Empire. Yes. And, and now, what was the reception for you covering this particular period of Swedish history? Uh, well, uh, let's say national Swedish television wanted to portray us as Nazis and stuff like that. And why? Because that, for some reason, no logical reason, but uh, this period of Sweden is usually used by right-wing extremists. Okay. And, uh, oh, because it, oh, this is what we used to be, mm. we were great, yeah. I think every, every nation the, has some part of their history that certain, I mean, whichever political group will sort of oh, latch try on and, you know, latch onto and try to make their own. And the uh, thing is with us then, they, oh yeah, and also to make it even worse, we were singing the national anthem at Sweden Rock Festival and played uh -huh. on the national day, that being said. So Swedish national day, they asked us if we, if we wanted to perform the national anthem and a few songs and we thought, okay. Yeah, it's nice because we got <clears throat> tickets to a great festival. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and that, of course, made it to actually national TV news in Sweden. Wait, but the national anthem was on at the end of the night, every single night, seven days a week on TV. Yep. And that's not because of right wing extremism. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was, so. uh, it was actually a bit of a media, well, not shitstorm, but a bit of a minefield for us. Well, what, well how, did it, how did it go? What kind of things did people say? How did you defend yourself? What was the. Uh, Oh, uh, actually, luckily these days, a lot of our fans, thank you for those of you, you know who you are, are uh, helping to defend us because we are be, might be called warmongers, uh, glorifiers of war. We, and yeah, we anything you don't that ends with- war. You do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's obvious as well, but I mean, take one lyric line from one song, you can make us look like anything, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, in Sweden in particular, this is a touchy subject, which is kind of funny because we had for several years been singing about Nazis and stuff and nobody cared. And then we sang about a hundred year Swedes. period of Swedish empire. And then people are starting to ask us, are you Nazis? <laughs> Never mind the fact that we've sung the word Nazi 50,000 times before in our mm -hmm. career. But no, but I mean, the, the weird thing is, uh, yeah, we had, well, it not our 15 minutes of fame in national television in 2012 and in magazines where people sort of media insinuated that we were like well, I mean, that. Because it's, it's if we sing about being Swedish, singing about the Swedish empire, you must be. You know? But you also sing about the decline and fall of the Swedish empire. Yes, we do. So, <laughs> and mean, what fucking cunts Sweden were yeah. in certain, you know, Colorful choice of words there, Joachim. Yes, thank you. Um, no, but Vishwa, you, you can understand called. to a certain extent some of the print media, like oh sure, Aftonbladet and Expressen, like the you know the, the tabloids thing. It's sensation; it'll sell. But but the more respectable papers say oh, like actually you know, they were better than yeah? the national Swedish radio and TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is weird, but no, I, I would say uh, uh, I think like I can't remember it was. Aftonbladet actually were the first to let us actually comment back on, on any right. such topic, you know? <clears throat> well, does it, and it's still, I, that's funny that it still haunts you a little bit to this day. I don't, I don't suppose it really affects things like tours no, and record sales. No, but. not really, but I mean, you can see that there's this, not that people are convinced, they just remember hearing about it, Sabaton being right-wing 10 almost, or eight years ago now. And that's still in the back of their heads. And we still, not, not had problems with it, but we, uh, when we are going, let's say, working with anything Swedish, in many cases, we, we, uh, we have to explain ourselves and really? show them, you know, and I mean, it takes five minutes. We're used to having to explain ourselves by now. Yeah. But it's kind of weird, actually. That, that's what Sweden got worried about. Never mind that you're singing about Ghost not, Division, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, singing exactly. about Rumble, that was fine. But don't you dare to sing no, about no, no, Carolus no, no, Rex. <laughs> but did it ever make you like angry? Did you ever like lose it? No, never never lose it, but getting so fucking tired of it, yes, sir, at, at times, absolutely. Would people say stuff to you in public about that? Or was that, was that okay? okay. Uh, well, most people I, I mean, anyone who knows us knows nobody has any, you know, crazy. Yeah. ideas about glorifying the Swedish Empire and stuff. So, I mean, here in Fallen, nah, 
not generally. We've been in, we've been around for so long. I don't think it's a, a big yeah. problem around here. I suppose everybody knows somebody who knows you or knows you. Yeah, I mean, it's not that big around here. Well, you have the festival too. Oh, we have the festival, yeah. So. How does that feel not having it this year? So weird, so weird. Yeah. Uh, because it's been like, yeah, we've been doing- That would doing... be like right around now, right? Yeah, it would oh, have been- so, you know, We're filming this in late August. Yeah, it would have been two weeks ago. Two weeks or ago. one in a week or something. Who, like. who were the bands that were playing? I don't remember even. Okay. Because it's free publicity right now, if you do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I got such bad memory. And you know, I, I might add here to this. I, it, it sounds like a dickhead thing, that, but if you do, let's say, 150 concerts every year. Yeah. And if you do, I don't know how many festivals and the billings on those, it's only if you have a super favorite band, you remember it. Yeah. Otherwise, I will, on a regular festival summer, let's do, we do 20 festivals, if I remember we were gonna play right before Kiss and I'm yeah. gonna watch the show after, then I might remember, you know? Oh, yeah. Other than that, I check it out before I go to the airport. Oh, let's see if there's any good bands I wanna see. Yeah. Because after a while doing thousands of shows, no, I, you sort of forget I'm, everything. I gotta admit, I, I love, I haven't done a, a, a real like Sabaton type festival summer since 2004. And that was with money. But we did like 35 festivals that summer. Sure. And they were, but it was all over Europe and stuff. But when people say, oh, well, you, you did, yeah, we played like nine German festivals that summer. And people are like, which ones? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> I genuinely have no idea. Uh, well, what towns were they near? I don't know. But the, the, I didn't know then. I knew yeah, we were exactly, exactly then. Exactly then, you know? yes. But I mean, so. that's a great thing about Germany and their festivals. Yeah. I don't know how, if there's any other country who has, I've gone to cities I've never heard of. Yeah. And they had a super nice rock festival. Yeah. And big five, one too. Big one. I mean, yeah. five, 6,000 people came. Yeah. And it's like, how is this possible? And I, yeah. I, now that you mention it, and I think back, I don't think there's any country that I, we are performing, uh, have performed in that has that many smaller festivals. Oh, all the city, like I, I, I do remember one, one little one. Well, it wasn't because it wasn't an, it wasn't a big. I remember playing at the Osnabrück City Festival, oh. and I remember it because I had never heard of Osnabrück before, <laughs> and I'd lived in Europe for a while. Yeah, <laughs> and, but um, I met a really nice girl there. Hey, hi by the way, if you're out there, I, I, I'm not gonna say her name. But uh, as long as I got a girlfriend anyway. Now. Oh, sorry. I hope I'm not breaking too many hearts. I have a girlfriend at the moment. She's really cool. Her name's Emily. I met her a few months ago. Hi, Emily. Uh, so, well, this was our three-part series on yes. the rise and fall of the Swedish Empire. And it's interesting, the commentary about it. What is an empire? How you decided and began to do the research for the lyrics and stuff. And then finally, what the reaction was, and especially the counter-reaction, the... Um, the you guys are Nazis reaction. Did you did you expect that in any in any way? Yeah, you did uh, think that was going to happen. We knew, obviously, being Swedish, so it's, it's not like we we can't say it came you know out of nowhere. We knew we were getting ourselves into a minefield. Okay. Other other artists have uh, covered this before, and they have uh, you know who even touched the subject has uh, had similar reactions as well. So. Okay. We knew sort of uh, that uh, we were gonna run into some troubles. So we can't really say, yeah, we, we, we know we have ourselves to blame for it. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I mean, you walk into it, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Well, still, it was, a, it, was a, it was a monumentally major step on, on the road that got you right here, sitting in a chair. Absolutely. Next to me, covered in fake green stuff. Mm. They can still see us, you know. Uh, camouflage, see. All right, and on that happy note, <laughs> you said cunt. <laughs> and now you did too. Okay, and on that happy note, that's it for the Swedish tr History Trilogy, and that's it for us today from Sabaton History. Thank you very much. subscriptions, check out Indy's other channels, become a Patreon. That's it, get the fuck out of here!